Hey, Renter Retires, it's Adam Schrader here for another episode, and I am joined as usual by Zach Lee Master, the founder and CEO of Rent to Retirement. And we are joined today by Joe Fairless. He is the co-founder of Ashcroft Capital. Joe, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my pleasure. Looking forward to our conversation. Yes, let's just start off with your the start of you. Um, how did you get into real estate and what was your first investment that you made? Well, I got into real estate because I invested. So I, I'm from Texas, originally moved to New York City right out, of, right out of college. I went to Texas Tech and I wanted to compete with the best of the best in advertising, which was my major. So I went to New York City and I worked on Madison Avenue right out of college. I graduated at the end of May and I had a job start. Yeah, I was starting the beginning of June. So there's really no transition time uh, and that was good because I had about $20,000 worth of loans, student loans that I needed to pay back. And I uh, was making $30,000, uh, at, uh, shy at day, which is the advertising agency. And that's you about live 700 that in New York city, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I had so much free cash flow. I didn't know what to do with it. <laughs> so I was living in this luxury built. No. So I, I had 750 bucks a month, uh, excuse me, every other week that I would get paid on my paycheck after taxes were taken out. So I had about 1500 bucks a month and my rent was about half of that. Um, and so I realized, and you know, if, if I wanted to eat and, uh, go to and from work, uh, then I'd also have to put money towards that. So I didn't have any money, uh, any discretionary money, um, really. And I kept my living exp expenses relatively low, uh, especially for New York City standards. So I was in New York for 10 years. And uh, my friends would make fun of me. Uh, they were saying, man, you're living like a college kid because year two, three, four, five, six, all the way up to year 10, I had a roommate. And... Uh, except for the first year, because I didn't know anyone when I moved to New York City, and then <laughs> year two, you wish you had a roommate. Two, yeah, <laughs> two through two through ten. And I was living in a very dangerous area, um, statistically speaking, of New York City when I moved there. Is East Flatbush, Brooklyn. Uh, Biggie Smalls wrote songs about East Flatbush, and uh, the the way that I approached investing was, well, I just need to survive right now. But as I got promoted in my full-time job, I kept my living expenses relatively low. I always had a roommate. I had an apartment that had two bedrooms, one for the roommate, one for me, one bedroom didn't have any windows. And so, um, you know, we would rotate six months on six months off depending on, you know, window to no window bedroom. And in the summers, man, it's hot in New York city, really hot. And I remember one year, uh, actually multiple years, uh, I, I was incredibly hot. So I had to figure out what, what's, what's, what's the solution. So uh, this is a, a safety tip, a non real estate safety tip for everyone who thinks of this dumb idea. Don't act on it. Like I did. Uh, I got a, a, a window unit for the air conditioning window unit. Well, I was in the room that didn't have the window, uh, but it was so hot. I thought, well, this might provide some, some, um, some coolness. So I plugged it into my room that had no windows. I put it on a dresser and it actually, it actually brought in some cooler air. Uh, if you put your face right in front of it, but the catch is that tons of hot exhaust was coming out the back of it. And so it's like the boiling a frog analogy. Like I was like slightly getting cooler in front, but then the whole room was getting hotter and hotter. And so yeah, that, that's the type of living arrangements I had for 10 years. And um, I eventually I, re, I was able to get promoted. I became the youngest vice president of a New York City advertising agency I was working at. And eventually my salary was $150,000, which is awesome. And I, I, okay, as along the way, I was like, well, what am I going to do with this extra money? And uh, so I, looked at, I was walking uh, uh, down Lexington Avenue in New York City and I saw Bank of America. They had a, a poster in the window and it said CD, like I forget the percentage, like 1.6%. I'm like, well, that's, I don't know what a CD is first off. <laughs> so I need to educate myself on that. But secondly, 
oh, wow, that's a lot more than I'm making in my savings account. So I did it. And I, that was my first thousand dollars that I had saved. And so they took my thousand dollars. I gave them my thousand dollars and they held it hostage for 12 long months. And then I got a return of about 20 bucks at the end of the 12 months. And then I got taxed on that 12, 20 bucks. And so it's like, there has got to be a better way. And so you asked, how did I get into real estate? Uh, well, I, I read after experiencing all that with that as the, the context, uh, I read investing for dummies and uh, then, you know, stocks, bonds, they talk about um, uh, investing in LLCs or startups, which is kind of odd that they talk about that in the book. And then they talk about real estate investing. And I just naturally gravitate towards real estate because I was a renter at the time and I lived in an apartment whenever I was growing up for a couple years. Uh, and so I, I just gravitate towards it. And then um, my, my first property was uh, in, I, I closed on it in October of 2009. And as everyone knows here, and you two obviously know that that was a challenging time to purchase property. We should have all purchased it then, but it was a challenging time to purchase it because of uh, lenders being non-existent or virtually non-existent. And um, I, I, I'd like to say that I, I knew at the time it was the perfect time to buy, but I didn't. It just, I just lucked into it. That's when I had my money saved and I was able to, to buy something. And it was a, a single family home in Duncanville, Texas, south of Dallas. And so I'm living in New York City and it was very challenging to get a lender to uh, accept me as a borrower because one, I didn't own any property in New York City. I didn't own a single family home. I'd never bought a home before. Uh, two, oh, by the way, I was living in New York City. This property is in, in Dallas. And three, it was a rental property. So there are all sorts of challenges that uh, came came to the surface with that. But ultimately, I, I wrote a letter to the lender and I gave references and you know did some other things to, to qualify myself. I got the loan and that was the first house. It was a $76,000 home in Duncanville, Texas, rented out for uh, $1,095 out of the gate. And uh, then you know off I went. Now, if you were investing in, this is your first investment and you decided the housing crash just happened, but I have money, let's invest. What gave you, I mean, I know you said you, you read the investing for dummies, but why then? I mean, so many people, like you were saying, were like, eh, no, lenders were like, whoa, no, for, the, for a lot of people. Yet you, for your first investment, decided 2009, you had the money, you're going to do it. Was there a specific thought in your head that was like, you know what? I'm just going to get into it or what led you to decide that that was the time? Well, it goes back to the fundamentals and I, I, I pick, and I, this isn't just hindsight 2020. This is me thinking this at the time. And that is the property cash flows. So the cash flows, who cares what the values do up and down, up and down, doesn't matter. The property cash flows it bought it for 76,000, uh, put a loan on it. And it rents for about 1100 That makes money. And uh, hopefully I'll sell in a time whenever the properties and values naturally appreciating. And that'd be great. But in the meantime, I'm going to cash flow. And so that, 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 that was my thought process. I love that you broke it down simply, uh, Joe, and you, you didn't overcomplicate it, right? It was just looking at the fundamentals and you acted on that in a time when everyone else was, was probably very concerned about real estate. Um, and you know, you're probably one of the bigger guests we've, we've had on the show. Uh, I mean, if people don't know who you, who you are, they, they should Google you and find out. I mean, you, you run Ashcroft capital, uh, your co-founder and CEO, you work, uh, run one of the, and organize one of the, the largest real estate conferences, the best ever conference. Um, and you're doing, you're doing big things, but thank you for walking us through your, your background story of just like, how you invested and coming from like you worked in that advertising career path for, for 10 years. Uh, I, I want to go back to two things that you talked about though. And one, did you, did you say that you plugged in a window AC unit in a room that had no windows? <laughs> uh, confirmed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Until we got enough money to buy a place with two windows. <laughs> uh, okay. So 
you're coming up in the world um, and glad, glad you made it through that experience. Um, so, but, but the thing that really stood out to me that you, you mentioned too, I, I think which would be applicable to a lot of our audience I want to talk more about is you're living in an expensive area. Um, yeah. You decide you want to buy, I mean, just, just in general, right? Regardless of specific yeah. location, like New York in general, it's hard to acquire sure. real estate there. Yeah, yeah. You uh, are, are busting your chops trying to make it. Um, and you decide that real estate is after reading a book, like this is like what connects with you. You want to invest in it. The first investment you buy is, is out of state, like across, yeah. across the country. <laughs> can we, can we, um, you know, cause a lot of our investors find themselves in the same scenario. They may be living in New York or one of these coastal markets, whatever the case is where it's just huge barrier to entry properties don't cash flow unless you're putting 50% down not landlord friendly legislation. Like it's just, it doesn't make yeah. sense for them. And so they're forced to look out of state. Um, let's talk about your journey of like, and maybe it wasn't overly complicated. You just look good area to invest cash flow. Um, and is that, I mean, can you talk about your mindset going through buying that first property out of state? And do you have any idea what that property is worth today? By the way, you bought it for 76,000. I bought it for 70. I'll answer that last question. I'll, I'll answer the, the other one. Um, I bought it for 76. I sold it for, um, 76 I made a hundred and five thousand on the transaction when I sold it and I sold it about four years three or four years ago so you know it was over two hundred thousand I don't I don't recall exactly what it was worth but I'm, I'm probably it'd probably be worth like 225 now 230 250 something awesome. around there you, you got me really curious um, <laughs> someone's I, getting a estimate right I, now. I do that sometimes yeah. where it's like yeah. uh you know you look at you look at previous price and, and almost every single time i'm like damn i wish i didn't sell that property <laughs> you know it's like yeah um and, but and I, I i wanted i wanted to look it up but um i i won't with with uh, be respectful to your audience because i'm getting my addresses mixed up with the address i currently live at and that address so i'm like i just typed in, in some some address and i was like that's not it but yeah it's probably worth about 225 230 so the the mindset i had living in new york city and investing in texas well one let's 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 be um let's call a spade a spade i was familiar with texas already I was from Texas. I grew up in Texas. So it's not like I was investing in a market I had never been to, but I still would have. If I wasn't from Texas or another market, I still would have invested in another market I hadn't been to if I knew someone, an objective third party, or knew someone who I trusted who told me, yes, this area, this market, uh, things are happening. It's a good area. Uh, you certainly can do a research on it also. Um, but I, I just like to, any market I go into, I like to have some sort of, fa they don't have to be in real estate, just some sort of family friend or, or acquaintance who lives in the area, familiar with the area, just get some anecdotal feedback. And ideally, maybe it's someone not in real estate, just, just to get their perspective on the area. But ultimately, my thought process is that you know, live where you want to live, invest where the numbers make sense. And what I, I learned, uh, yeah, I, I, said, I said I read that one book, which I did, Investing for Dummies, but I was reading a bunch of books. Like I, I've, I've read a lot of them. And I was also attending seminars and I was also uh, watching YouTube videos. So I was doing a whole lot of, of learning and I still do. Um, but in one of, the, one of the seminars I went to, um, they talked about how everybody in the United States lives in one of two markets. They live in a money market or they live in a deal market. And New York City, it's a money market. There's people with money. Texas it, or Dallas specifically, that's more of a deal market. Now, certainly there's, 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 a, there's, a, there's a chart and everyone's like somewhere in the middle. It's not like uh, they're not mutually exclusive. So some blend of that, but because there's a lot of rich people in Dallas um, but generally speaking, there's where you can find cash flowing deals and there's where you can fi find um, non cash flowing deals, but higher income uh, uh, people who have uh, who own homes that are worth a lot more through natural appreciation. But when there's a bus that takes place, there's a big old bus that takes place there, whereas the cash flowing markets tend to be uh, 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 shorter peaks and valleys. So. I, I, I wanted to be in a market that cash flowed out of the gate 
I wanted a market that I was familiar with. Um, and I, I wanted a market that, um, when I, when I looked up the fundamentals, um, and I, I had a list of fundamentals that I was looking for. It checked those boxes. I want to be less than ten thousand dollars. Excuse me. Yes, ten thousand dollars to be moving ready. I want to cash flow at least a thousand dollars a month, and I want it to uh, not have a pool um, for liability. I want it to have a as small of a yard as possible, so that the property took up as much of the property as possible. That way, it. Um, I maximize the depreciation I can uh, as much as I can on the property because you can't depreciate land, but you can depreciate the property itself. So I wanted the whole property ideally to take up the whole piece of land. Um, yeah, I I wanted it to um, you know be a property that I could just a turnkey property. I wanted to be a turnkey property so that I could then um, not have to try and do the renovations remotely. Uh, because, you saw the financial benefit of investing in real estate, but you didn't want to be actively dealing with it, managing it, right? Like you, you went in investing with that intention of, I want to own I real estate. I, I, I never visited the property uh, and I, I didn't visit it once before I bought it. Um, and I ended up getting up to four single family homes and out of those four single family homes that I purchased, I probably visited them in total twice. Like out of those four, I visited two of them and I think I went in one of the homes and that was like mind bending for the people who I spoke to. Like, you haven't been to the house? Like, no, you haven't been inside the house? No. Like, how do you have the comfort level? Well, video, like the people <laughs> on the ground, they, appraisal, yeah. Right? yeah. <laughs> and that's what I said, the inspection, the appraisal, because listen, I, I was an advertising person at the time. Like I didn't know real estate. Like if I go there, what the heck am I, what value am I going to provide to the assessment of if it's the right house or not? Like that, that's not my area of expertise. That's the inspector's area of expertise. And then is it the right value? Well, let's look at comps. I can do that. Let's look at the appraisal. I can do that. So let's, let's let all the experts do what they do and then let me kind of direct traffic and and that's how my approach was yeah i went and saw some of my properties just a couple of weeks ago and i realized that i came back and i was talking with the guy yesterday we were talking about some real estate stuff and i said yeah i went and visited my properties in memphis and you know i got to go and i got to go inside two of them because they were vacant and doing turns and i realized when i got there and saw them yep this is a house and that was about that was about as much use as I could be in that situation. Uh, yeah. I like being emotionally emotionally detached from it too. You know, it's like sometimes if you uh -huh. if you're investing locally right next to you and you have to drive by or if you're self managing, like that is that that sometimes can be a little bit of an emotional roller coaster because you're emotionally dealing with it, right? And I oh, same sort of yeah. thing. I want my investments to be separated out. The whole point of owning real estate is so I don't have to deal with it, and it provides other things in life. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, yeah, I'm. I'm the same way. I mean, it's. Uh, I. I'm not in love. I'm not passionate about real estate. I'm passionate about what it. What it creates for me, my family, and those around me. So, talk about the your evolution. And you mentioned that you had the the four single families. Did you just have the four? Did you start going into more commercial at that point, or how did your journey continue from? the first property? Uh, well, it was a big step from the four properties to the next one. Um, uh, I, I will close the loop on that first one. I remembered the address, 1051 Gaynor Avenue, Duncanville, Texas. Uh, Zillow says it's worth 275000 as of mm. as of right now. So there's there's that. Um, How much is the rent estimate on that? Uh, let's curious. see. Probably more yeah, than 1100 I would guess, at this point in time. Yeah, 2200 so let's just real quick since you call out those numbers which is now the price is like you know and this is what 13 14 years later whatever it is and the price is like tripled or more um more than true maybe quadrupled but uh rents have more than doubled i mean this is to your point joe this is what you would refer to as a deal market or a cash flow market mm. and if you, and I'm sure you had your reasons for selling that. I mean, at some point, like same thing with us, we 1031 or take equity out and move it around and trade up and keep trading up. Scalability is the name of the game. But mm -hmm. just the point of that, like if you just buy rental real estate 
and hold it and let time do what it does over time. Like, you know, it doesn't take a lot of those, you know, regular type of rentals to create, you know, substantial wealth and, and residual income. Would you agree? I would agree. Yeah. Um, I think the name there, there's a couple things that if, if I were, you know, I do apartment, large apartment buildings, but if I were doing single family homes, the things that I would keep in mind would be one, uh, having a, a home that is located in a good school district. Uh, so that pretty much, uh, makes the market a safe market. I mean, more or less, obviously there's plenty of other things to look at, but if I had to drill it down, I'd say a good school district, a, a home that is, um, well taken care of or relatively new within the last 30 years, 30, 35 years or so, just to try to head off deferred maintenance. Um, and I, I, I would look for, I would look for, for properties that, um, or I'd say the third thing would be the management and specifically keeping the tenants in the home for as long as possible with reasonable rent increases. Because what, what my experience was, uh, I had to fire my first property management company and I leased out the home myself. Um, and, that was a disaster. Uh, they ended up not working out. And the, the major expenses uh, are when someone moves out. And so my, my, my goal whenever I was owning the homes was keep the ten- qualify the tenants really well, make it a great living experience for them, have reasonable rent increases. Uh, I, I didn't want to be over the top because, you know, $25 more a month could push someone away. And if they go away, then having it to be move-in ready again, I mean, that's $5,000. And those 250 bucks a month that I was making from that rental property, it goes, it, it gets wiped away from that move, move, move out expenses. So I would, that would be my focus is having quality tenants who are in there for the long run and just keep them there as much as as long as possible. What made you decide, uh, you know, you mentioned the management and we've talked about property management and how important it is here frequently. Uh, What were some of the signs that you got that the management company wasn't for you anymore? They didn't find a tenant. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I was my first home. I didn't know what I was doing. They didn't, but I knew they weren't doing anything either. They didn't find tenants. So it wasn't, Um, they placed somebody and then it didn't go well. It was just, they never found no. somebody. No, I ended up building a, a website for my house like, to get it listed on a post on Craigslist and doing, doing a bunch of things. Uh, one lesson I learned from that is um, don't find your property management company through Google instead, find it through um, one suggestion I have is find it through a, a real, the real estate agent that's helping you find your property because that real estate agent wants you to buy more property. And if you have a good experience with the property that he or she sells you, uh, well, then they're going to, you're going to probably buy more property. Therefore there's alignment of interest. Uh, plus they'll know the market, uh, and they'll know who's, who's good for, for, uh, for property managers and who don't, who do not have the best reputation because the one I found on Google, uh, I won't mention their name, but everyone has heard of this company cause it's with a large brokerage. And, and so um, even the, you know, the large brokerage name uh, did not translate into being a good property manager. Yeah. We, we see that a lot. Um, you know, I, I've been the most successful, at least for like the small multifamily and residential finding the kind of middle of the ground, uh, property managers, not the super small mom and pop, but also not big names. But I, I think, yeah, having recommendations from people that are our investors that are successful, like that's the, you know, getting those actual recommendations, mm-hmm. whether that's attending local RIAs or now you have a lot of online resources where you can communicate with other people that are, have recommendations for property managers um, and, and leveraging the, the professionals in that area, as, as you mentioned previously, is, is huge. 
And marketing is something that I think mm-hmm. a lot of people forget about with, with management. It's like in short-term rentals, marketing, it's all about marketing and running business, but that's oh, also yeah. important to attract long, long-term long tenants too, right? If you can't, mm-hmm. if you can't market a house appropriately, if you don't have good photo in a lot, of, I mean, you, you come from a marketing background, right? So, but if, if, um, if you're not marketing the space, the tenant, no, no matter what type of tenant you're trying to track, that is marketing. And it's really important. Look at some of their listings. You need to be listed one across all the sites. It needs to be an attractive, enticing listing with good photos. I mean, so many times we see these long-term um, property managers that have terrible listings and terrible photos. It's like, come on, right? I mean, it could be the, mm-hmm. that that alone could can make or break the difference for you. But Joe, let's mm-hmm. continue the the saga of Joe Fairless and what, okay. So you're, you're, uh, you got the first property. Um, and you, it sounds like you started to acquire more, like what's, what's next. What you kind of got the bug, you got your foundation, you're learning like why, how, and why did you continue to scale? And what did that journey look like? Yeah. I bought my first house in October of 2009. And then I bought my next one about a year later. That was for, I think $81,000. Um, the first house I bought 20% down typical traditional loan. Uh, second house I bought with uh, a loan program. I don't think exists anymore for investors called the home path loan. I only had to put 10% down. So I was looking for homes that specifically qualified for that loan. Uh, the third house I bought all cash uh, is for $65,000. So at this point, you know, I was making hundred and probably 25,000 or so a year and I was saving like 80% of it. Uh, so I was able to buy that for cash, but then I, um, did a cash out refinance, I had a refinance for more than that. I think like 85,000 or something. So I got most of my money back out, uh, from that. Um, and then my fourth house was the ugly duckling. Uh, I bought with a line of credit from American airlines credit union. I had a $35,000 line of credit from them. I got an email from a wholesaler said $30,000. You can get this house and it's about 5,000 in repairs. Uh, so I thought, well, like it couldn't be more perfect. Like literally it was, those were the numbers. So I was like, okay, perfect. Well, I'm sure the wholesalers tell me the truth, right? <laughs> nope. Uh, so I, I bought the house $30,000 and you know it, it's on me, not on them. By the way, obviously, it's it's my responsibility to do the diligence. So I bought the house for thirty thousand dollars. It ended up costing about fifteen thousand in repairs, and um, yeah, I'm I'm all in for forty five thousand or so. And after all the repairs and going through multiple contractors, um, you know, I, I, I was renting it for maybe a hundred dollars more than what it could have rented for prior to doing the $15,000 in repairs. So it was just, it was just a mess. Um, I, I ended up selling that home. Oh, all of them, but I sold that one first. I got out of that one first. Uh, I think I maybe lost 3000 bucks or something because I was fortunate. I was in Dallas. All these are in Dallas, Fort Worth. So I was in a appreciating market and I sold at, you know, three or four years after 2009 or so. So, it was it, it wasn't a, a a big deal, um, but it was it was a big lesson. And what that lesson is, I'm in New York City and I'm trying to find contractors and I'm trying to manage the contractors uh, and qualify and make sure that they're doing their work. That's it. It just it, it's not not I I didn't do it properly. I'm sure there's ways to do that, but it it did not work out for me. Um, so I. I I, cause I got away the other, the first three were turnkey, uh, whereas the fourth one was, um, a lot messier and it was, it was not, not a good outcome. Um, so then, uh, at, at that point I had those, uh, before I sold the fourth, I had those four homes and my friends were asking me, Hey, you know, how'd you, how are you doing what you're doing? And I'm living in New York city and you know, my coworkers are asking me what I'm doing. And I'm like, well, I, I told them. And then, and then I got more and more people asking me that. So I taught a class on it, an in-person class in New York City. Uh, first time, like three people came, it, maybe two people came. And then um, eventually I had up to about 20 people attending the class. You know, they paid like between 25 to $50 a person to attend the class. Uh, and I taught them for a couple hours on how I was living in New York City 
but investing where the numbers made sense. And uh, then, you know, one, one of my uh, former bosses, he attended and he said, you know, this looks great. Um, if you do something larger, let me know. Uh, and so, you know, I, I realized that I had a customer before I had a product. So I had an investor before I had something larger. So that's why I started looking at apartment buildings. Nice. You explained some of your criteria for, you know, getting properties whenever you first started. Has anything in your criteria changed over the years or what are you looking for now? Oh, yeah, it's a tough question. The reason why is I haven't bought a home in over a decade, uh, like a rental home in over a decade. So I haven't really looked for homes. I bought apartment buildings. Did your criteria um, for those change significantly from the single families? Uh, well, you, you know, one main, one major lesson I learned a very hard way, uh, on my first apartment building. So I went from four single family homes to 168 unit apartment building. <laughs> so, uh, not the typical, uh, jump, uh, that people would take. I mean, I, I went off, off the cliff, uh, and went cliff diving. Basically I, I learned that apartment buildings are were nothing like my three my first three single family homes uh in that the first three single family homes were turnkey and it was beautiful i would check the deposit every month because that was cool to see with the three homes i would look at the um you know look at the the monthly statement that was interesting too that was it that was really it and so i thought with the apartment community hey it's on the numbers are cash flowing looks good and so all i need to do is buy it i don't really need reserves because you know, it's cash flowing i can always use the cash flow to build up reserves and that's it it's a cash flow play and that was that was not the case it was i bought a, a apartment community built around the the 70s and it's uh, required a lot of work and i made all every mistake in the book and so uh, you asked has my criteria changed or did it change well there was just a major awareness that took place that apart value add apartment buildings which i, I didn't even realize i was buying at the time um be, again on me for not realizing that but value add apartment buildings are completely different than the three single family homes that I purchased. I mean, it's, it, it, it's a job. It's, it's very, it's, it's an active job and you've got to have the right people in place. Um, and so that, that was a, a, a big aha. It's like, Oh wait, I'm buying an apartment building, not because it's a passive income to make, you know, cash flow from I'm buying an apartment building because I'm buying a business. And then that business is one that needs operations and the operations, when you do well, you get rewarded handsomely, but it's a full-time job. And, and the operations, are, it sounds like on, on this one that you acquired is, is not optimal, which means there's opportunity, but also like, like you mentioned, a, a full-time job. So this is, this is a common path that, I mean, same thing with, with ourselves. I mean, I would say that almost, almost every investor that has continued on to invest in larger scale deals, like starts with small multi, single family, you know, and that's, that's a good foundation. Um, we, we are big supporters of that because I think it's good to have that foundation and, and perspective and usually single family are more predictable, low risk, uh, more accessible and, you know, better financing options. But you took in your progression, Joe, you took a huge leap. As you mentioned, you went to, you know, like, you know, a handful of, of single family uh, all the way to like straight into multifamily. Uh, talk to us about like the mindset of, of why though. And I think it is important, important to point out that you, you stumbled through some of this um, and you're yeah. at least acknowledging that no, no one is goes into any of these asset classes, even their first investment, by the way. I mean, you've stated this clearly multiple times, like you didn't know everything. Sometimes you just don't know what you don't know, but you had a plan, at least generally, like you knew what you wanted to do and then you took action on it, um, which, which is key. And you learned along the way and look at how much you've accomplished and now at this point, but I guess my point is to the audience is like, don't, don't let fear hold you back or the fear of the unknown. You don't have to know everything going in. Certainly you want to have a criteria and do due diligence, but like part of the investing process is, is learning as you go. 
and then, mm-hmm. you know, applying that, what you learn to make yourself a better investor. But anyways, with your story, you, you like scaled up tremendously. I, I want to know, like, what is the reason behind, behind that? And let's talk about that first large multifamily deal. How did you finance that? I mean, you probably, what was it investors? Was this a true, like, were you bringing partners in? You probably didn't have enough. You weren't able to qualify for financing just on your own. Were you, or let's talk about that. No, no. Yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll answer that directly, but I want to address what you, you mentioned. Cause I, I like what you said, um, about, you know, the, the fear factor, I would say it's something I heard. I've heard Tony Robbins talk about, he talks about how, uh, if he, uh, were to, um, if he were to not pursue things that he doesn't have experience doing, then he wouldn't do anything. Like if we were to experience, if we were to try to do, th- if, if we're thinking, Hey, I want to do this. Ah, I don't have that experience. Then we wouldn't do anything. And so it's not about, uh, if we have experience doing it, if we know enough, it's, are we capable of doing it? That's the key. So yeah, I'm capable of doing that. Others have done it. I got to learn how to do it, but I'm capable of it. So I, I would suggest that uh, we use that question. We ask ourselves that question. Am, am I capable of putting that together? Uh, have others done that? And if so, well, then they were capable of doing it because they did it. Uh, as far as the financing goes, yeah, I, no, I, I, <laughs> uh, I, I left adver- the advertising industry I wrote a, a email to my, my family, my mom, my dad, my two brothers, my sister. I wrote it to them in November of 2012. Uh, and I was, uh, I emailed that to them. I was at a, at the, at a bar. I wasn't drunk, but yeah, I probably had a beer in me. I was, I was at a bar and I, I emailed them and I said, uh, I'm quitting my advertising job at the beginning of the year. Uh, I came, I conquered, and now I don't care about it at all anymore. And I said, I'm going to you know, do real estate full time. Uh, I said, the only thing that would depend on if the only thing that would delay that is if I, I don't get the cash out refinance on my third house, the one I told you about that I bought all cash. If that doesn't happen, then that's a different situation. Um, but I, I, that cash out refinance took place and I had about $50,000 in January of 2013. So that's what I had. So you do not get finance <laughs> uh, for a 168 unit apartment building when you have $50,000 cash in your bank and that's it other than the three home, the four homes at the time that I owned. Um, so correct, you're correct. I did not qualify for financing. That deal was a creative financing, actually. It was a master lease with option to purchase. And so uh, the financing stayed in place. We simply took over as uh, the group that was leasing the property. And uh, we had the option to purchase it at a later date. And so there was no, the only, the only thing from a financing standpoint that was required was the lender had to approve the master lease with option to purchase. And the owner still stayed on as a guarantor. So the, the insurance company didn't care that we were doing a master lease with the option to purchase. And, and how did you find this deal? Were you actively pursuing it? Were you remarketing? Like, is this now your business that you're trying to find this specific type of asset class? I mean, again, this is a huge jump from. Yeah. Um, it's, it's definitely um, not, we, we don't do creative financing. Generally speaking, uh, we, we, at this point, I mean, we've got 2.7 billion worth of apartment communities. So we can probably find the best financing available uh, given our balance sheets and our track record for our apartment community. So we focus on that. Um, and the properties that we buy currently don't really offer that type of financing. Although, you know, in the next six months, uh, maybe there will be some creative uh, creative um, opportunities with um, what might be coming for, for some owners. Um, I found it through a, a consultant that I had hired to help me learn apartment investing. And I initially thought I was going to be in Tulsa, Oklahoma, because uh, I loved the market and it was uh, under the radar market. And so, yeah, I, I traveled to Tulsa, Oklahoma which again, when I got, you know, I got $50,000 in my bank account with no money coming in other than that class I'm teaching every week 
which brings in, you know, $25 a person times 10 people. So uh, money was bleeding quickly. And I, but I traveled to Tulsa, tried, uh, I looked at some properties there, made offers. And my, my thought was because of the people I talked to that I could raise about 250 to $300,000. And so I was looking at a million dollar, million dollar properties around 30 units. That's how much they were at the time. Uh, but I didn't get any traction in Tulsa. And then my, the consultant I was working with said, well, what about this property? And it was in Cincinnati, Ohio. I had never been there. And I was like, well, tell me more. And so learn more about it. And that's ultimately the one I ended up um, acquiring. Yeah. Now, how, do, how have you built your team doing that? Because we've talked about the importance of teams, you know, whenever you had your single family with, you know, you're the inspector, the appraiser, the uh, management company, all of that. And then you mentioned how you had your one that you were, you know, rehabbing from afar and it didn't go well with the five to 15,000. Now you're doing value adds, you know, of 168 units in a place that you, you don't live. So how have you managed to build your team out um, from afar in the, the, you know, apartment space? Well, there's, there's three components to what I do. You have money deal and execution have to have the money to buy the deal. You got to have the deal and you got to be able to execute. So those are the three departments that need to be built out money deal execution. Um, at the very top, I am the co-founder of Ashcroft, uh, Frank, my, the other co-founder, my partner, he, uh, has skill sets that I do not have. And he has a traditional background in real estate. Uh, he worked for a company that does what we do eight or so years prior to when we founded Ashcroft. So he was doing this for eight years before we founded Ashcroft. Um, so he oversees the deal and execution portion. And I, re- I oversee the money portion. Um, now we overlap some, uh, but very little. And um we build out a team accordingly based on, based on those, those three categories. He's responsible for hiring and overseeing the people in the uh, deals and execution part. So that's asset management, that's analysts, that's um, acquisitions. Um, and he oversees the property management arm, uh, Birchstone Capital, which we uh, own. We own our own property management company and in-house construction management company. Um, and then I oversee marketing, investor relations, and investor services, the people who are responsible for attracting, uh, guiding and converting investors. Do you, um, do you have options for accredited and unaccredited, or do you only take accredited investors? We only take accredited. Um, let's as we kind of come close to the end here, Joe, I have, I mean, I have so much I want to pick your, your brain on, but um, what would you, uh, let me ask you about the market first. It, it's been a while actually, since we kind of just asked about the state of the state of the market and, and where, where we think this next six to 12 months or 18 months is, is going to be. Um, so if you could just look into your crystal ball and, and give us the answer, that would be great. Or at least your opinion in the spaces that you operate in. Like what, what do you think? Where do you think we're headed? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I I can't predict anything. I, I can't predict accurately. I well, I could, I might, but it's unlikely I'll completely accurately predict it. Um, just like anyone who can't tell the future. But what I'll say is that there's going there's distress in uh, the multi. I'm I'll talk about multifamily specifically because that's my world. There's distress in multifamily, and um, I'd say we're only 25, 30, 20 to 25% of the way through it. I think there's, there's going to be a lot more distress uh, in the next six months. Um, so through the rest of the year, this, this calendar year, there will be more distress. I know that because, uh, or I speculate that, and it's, I'm pretty sure it's going to be right, because uh, two reasons. Um, one, my experience as a limited partner and one, my experience as a general partner. My experience as a general partner, well, uh, we're being sent, uh, I'm being sent 
opportunities from operators who know me and they're looking for rescue capital uh, or they're looking to be purchased. Uh, the properties are looking to be purchased. Um, just happened yesterday, actually, a, a property in Houston. Um, I know my from my experience as an LP because I'm currently an active or I'm, I'm currently I have 123 current deals as an LP. So I'm a passive investor in 123 deals that are happening right now. In total, I've invested 155 deals uh, as an LP. So I currently have 123 deals as a passive investor spread out across probably about 25 different operators. And um, there have been three capital calls, so not a lot, but I think those are the, those three are the ones that are getting ahead of it um, earlier than the others. Uh, I was on a call yesterday where, um, and this is my fault because I invested in ground up development on two of the 123. So not a lot, but those two, the capital is probably gone uh, because of the change in market and the team wasn't resourceful and a whole host of other issues. So taking a step back, I think there's going to be more distress over the next six months. There's going to be buying opportunities. I think interest rates are going to go up two more times, but that's not just, I mean, that's not me. I'm just a parrot for what is pre, what the financial gurus are predicting. Um, but I, I, I believe them. I think fin the interest rates will go up two more times and that's just going to break um, a lot of operators uh, who don't have adequate cash reserves um, and, and don't have the liquidity to withstand things because there's not a lot of them that, I mean, 123 deals. I've only had capital calls for a handful there should be capital calls for a lot more than that is what I speculate. And I think it's just ignorance, uh, ignorance or pride. Define a capital call, please. Capital call is where uh, the operator says uh, we need more money and we need it in order to operate the business. And it's more than what we anticipated we would need. So investors who are passive, will you please give us more money? If not, we're going to need to do a fire sale sell at a loss uh, or might have to give back the keys. So this is something we've never talked about um, with any sort of like uh, syndication or, or uh, you know, type, type of business operation is that like, these are potential scenarios, right? You mentioned a couple of scenarios. I think that we're mainly dealing with ground up construction with inappropriate operators that uh, in, in, a in a challenging time for, for ground up construction, we know all about that. But um, that they actually, you said the capital could be gone completely. So that's that's a potential option, or that's a potential outcome of of um, you know investing your capital as an LP with someone too. Is like you could you could have a capital call. You could have to invest more money. You could lose money, potentially all of it. Um, and you you're doing it smart where you're spread across a lot of these different deals. So these are outside of Ashcroft, right? I mean, this is uh, of the hundred twenty three. Yeah, of the 123, that includes my Ashcroft investments. So, um, you know, knock out about 40 of the 123 and the remainder are spread out across other operators. I'm just curious about that alone. That was like, so were those before you founded Ashcroft or like, are you just diversifying outside no. of yourself, yourself or what's the reason behind? Oh, it, it, it it's to, uh, it's, it's all of them have been since I founded Ashcroft and I'm our, third, second or third largest investor as a passive investor with Ashcroft. So uh, I, 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 I'm in, I, I'm aligned, um, but it's beneficial for me to get exposure to what other people are doing for many reasons. One, learn different markets. Two, learn how they operate, their communication. Uh, three, helps me keep a pulse on what's going on in the industry. And four, it builds, um, it builds um, reciprocity with those operators. Uh, I'm an investor in their deal, therefore they would treat they treat me differently as they should because I'm an investor in their deal versus just you know some other operator. So I I have um, I have more alignment and uh, better relationships with 
25 or so different operators because I'm a passive investor. So it, it just allows me so much, um, so, so much insight into what's taking place across all a bunch of different operators, a bunch of different markets. It's, Joe, it's we pretty would, incredible. I love that you stated that we would call that the abundance mindset instead of the scarcity mm-hmm. mindset, right? Of like, sure. Hey, we're, yeah. all, we're all out in this, um, in this game together. And, you know, we don't all have to be just, competing against each other. I mean, even though we're in the turnkey space, I buy turnkey all the time outside of our own organization, mm-hmm. even outside of the, you know, quote unquote turnkey space. A lot of like, the, we, we invest a lot personally in commercial retail centers and yeah. those are, I would consider those about as turnkey as it gets because, and they're low oh, caps. Wow. These are five caps, but it's a, it's a money placement place for us. Um, and we get the tax benefits of them, but they're long-term leases, but like, you know, so it's, it's all about, um, having that abundance mindset. I love that. Thanks for talking about the market. Uh, I wanted to go back and requote you from the beginning uh, of the show when, um, you know, you're, you're actively out there acquiring properties and this is, um, you know, your market insight is, is important in talking about buying opportunity, but this is coming from someone who bought their first property in 2009 when everyone else was running from the Hills and you stayed at the very beginning comes back to the fundamentals. And we always talk about yeah. that too, right? If the property's cash flowing, if you're in a growing market, like, you know, it doesn't matter. Ignore the short, nope. ignore the fluctuations, right? And ignore all the noise. Yeah. It's all about investing consistently over time in any market cycle, finding a way to be successful and continuing to grow that. So I think we've like just witnessed that throughout your journey. So I just wanted to point that out. And I, 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 if you search three immutable laws of real estate investing, Joe Fairless, you'll come to uh, three things, which you don't need the search. I'll tell you right now. One, buy for cash flow. Two, secure long term, low leverage debt. And three, have adequate cash reserves. If you do those three things, you're good. Doesn't matter when you're buying, you're good. And you're going to benefit because the first one is buy for cash flow. Yeah. Love it. What markets are you? Um are you seeing? Are you liking the most right now? And you know, you mentioned some of the distressed assets out there are you seeing a consistent thing where you're saying you know hey these uh these may not be the best places at the moment uh we buy in dallas fort worth tampa orlando jacksonville chapel hill uh atlanta that's where we currently own apartment communities um atlanta's softening a little bit right now uh, so is Dallas, Fort Worth. A lot of a lot of new construction taking place, um, but they're generally, or they're still fundamentally, I should say, they're still strong markets. Uh, the markets that you know we're seeing more uh, uh, rent decreases, or we're seeing rent decreases, Phoenix, Las Vegas, uh, and those are markets we've looked at in the past, but. Yeah, uh, they're, 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 they're too uh, extreme uh, from a, a rent um, fluctuation standpoint for us at this point, at least. Joe, is there any final words of advice you'd have for someone that is just wanting to, I guess, if they're, if they're in your position, um, you know, a decade ago or, or longer where they're, maybe they've acquired one or two rentals. Maybe they're looking to invest out of state. Maybe this is their first property, but someone that's just mm-hmm. looking to get, get in the game. Um, but they're, they've got this analysis paralysis or they're letting fear hold them back or they're concerned about the market. There's always something mm-hmm. in the news, right? But what would you be your advice to, to that particular person? Well, first advice, if they're watching a lot of news is don't watch a lot of news, just <laughs> focus on, Fundamental. I mean, we're inundated with information, but we don't have a lot of wisdom around us, generally speaking. And so find people, find organizations like you all uh, who have the wisdom and who can help guide and consult. And um, so that's the first thing is surround your, yourself with the right wisdom, not just information. Um, the second is... As I mentioned earlier, I'll reiterate it because I think it's important. Uh, when looking to buy your first property or looking to scale up or looking to do two more deals, and if there's some uncertainty there, first off, 
that's that's reasonable and you're a a sane person for thinking that that um but then think am i capable of it and if your answer is like i don't know well have others done it well then the answer is yes uh and everyone starts at a point where they've got to learn the learn the learning curve and experience it so being around uh, people who have, have the right experience is is the best approach that that um, that I've I've taken. Um, you're still going to make mistakes. You're still going to lose some money along the way, but we're in a um, we're we're talking about a business model that is tried and true. We're not. This isn't a um, a startup venture podcast where I'm talking about how to create the next Facebook or the next threads or next Instagram, like the, the, this, what we're talking about, real estate, cash flowing property, people rent, pay us rent. We own the property and it appreciates over time. That's, that's fact that that, that happens and it's, it's been happening. So I, I would also encourage everyone, everyone who's has those un, that uncertainty, just think about, the business plan is solid. It's just a matter of um, you executing the business plan. All right. Now, uh, we've talked a little bit about Ashcroft Capital. Um, You have a conference coming up in uh, April of 2024 um, that's, uh, you know, humbly titled the best ever conference. (laughs) Uh, Can you tell us a a little bit about that? Yeah. um, Well, Ironically, the three characteristics of people who attend, one, they are humble, uh, two, they're experienced, and three, they're collaborative. So if you're a humble, experienced, and collaborative commercial real estate investor or want to be a passive investor, this is all, it's a strictly commercial real estate conference, by the way. So um, self-storage, retail, office, apartments, um, industrial, um, I'm sure I'm missing a couple, but it's commercial real estate investors who are humble, experienced, and collaborative. And if you are those characteristics, or if you want to be around others who share those characteristics uh, and passively invest in deals, learn about it, or actively, um, you know, invest in and learn how to create the business, then this is the conference to be at. It's a whole lot of fun. Uh, don't take my word for it. Just ask someone uh, maybe you know post on facebook or something who's been the best ever conference i guarantee you you're going to hear some really good feedback from those people fantastic well joe thank you so much for joining us really appreciate it the website for the conference is besteverconference.com but if you want to check out his company that he's co-founder of that's at ashcroftcapital.com that's ashcroftcapital.com if you want to check out any single families before you go to that uh, route, you can find that at renttoretirement.com. That's renttoretirement.com. You can schedule a time to talk with us, see our inventory there. And as I asked him at the end about the markets, if you are interested in hearing about what Zach thinks are the best markets to invest in in 2023, you can just send an email to podcast at renttoretirement.com. That's podcast at renttoretirement.com. And we'll get that report sent out to you. Really appreciate the time you spent educating yourself today. We'll talk to you on the next episode. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos, like this one, or this one here.